What's on your playlist right now? I'm going to my class. Um... Go to guilty pleasure food. Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joe Farrell. I was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan, where I lived for the first 10 years of my life. Our family moved to Monterey, California when I was going into the fifth grade. I enjoyed a really nice life in Monterey where I learned to play golf. I was actually a flat track racer and even started my career in law enforcement with a local police department there in the city of Pacific Grove. I've been with UC Davis since August of 2017 after spending 30 years with the California Highway Patrol my last 10 as the commissioner. I enjoy working at UC Davis Police Department, surrounded by so many who share my desire to keep our community safe. I love doing what I do, but my true passion has always been around the topic of mental illness. I currently serve as the president of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, where I strive to build a better community discussion around mental health and police response to mental illness. I enjoy the work I do at UC Davis, transforming our campus policing model to a more contemporary needs response model as we acknowledge the ongoing dialogue both locally and nationally. Welcome to Face to Face. Joe, I've been looking forward to this, and uh, thank you for sitting down and talking with me. No, thank you for the invitation. I've been looking forward to it equally as well. Yeah, you, you know, um, we actually started at UC Davis the same time, same year. Um, so you've been police chief now here for five years. Uh, this is year number six. Um, I want to first just say how much we appreciate all your leadership uh, and the way you uh, keep the campus safe uh, um, and do, do what you do for the community as well. Now, before you came to UC Davis, you were commissioner of the California Highway Patrol. Uh, it's one of the nation's uh, largest uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, what made somebody like you want to come to a university like UC Davis? That's a really good question. And first of all, thank you. It, it is an honor and a privilege to serve the university. It, it was a dream come true. Uh, for me, when I was ending my career with the California Highway Patrol, I was looking for something that I could do to make a contribution, something with all the lessons learned and the experiences I had with CHP, where could I apply it the best? And a friend of mine, a mutual friend of ours who used to be chief counsel here, called me one day and said, have you ever thought about coming to the University of California? And he planted the seed, and from there I started doing a lot of research. I started to figure out what the university setting was all about and what your mission was. And I realized at that time that that ongoing conversation about reimagining policing was becoming very real. It was prominent, and it was really time to, 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 to bring contemporary standards into a university setting and really set the stage and lead. And as I started to go through my process of onboarding, and, and I started to learn a lot about this university, and really, and, and not just because you're sitting here, it all ended with a conversation with you. Your last day at Georgia Tech, my first day here, and we had a conversation about, can you change the dialogue? Can you change the discussion about policing? And to me, that was a calling, it was a challenge, and, uh, and I thought that, if not me, then who? And I thought I would be the person to be able to do that. And uh, the rest of it was just, let's get there, let's get to work. And I've never looked back. I remember that phone call very well. As you said, it was my last day, I think, at Georgia Tech. And uh, I really wanted to talk to you about this idea of community policing versus the traditional command and control model that right. uh, people are familiar with. And your, your answer really gave me, uh, was really heartening. It really gave me some uh, positive uh, vibes. And uh, I guess I should send the friend that put the bug in your ear a uh, thank you note because uh, <laughs> uh, the whole campus has really benefited from from your experience here, Joe. So I just want to make that uh, clear to our audience. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, we also talk a lot about diversity uh, at, at UC Davis in general, but in pol the police force in particular. Um, so you, you championed a new state law that just went into effect that allows anyone legally authorized to work in the U.S. to become a peace officer, uh, regardless of their citizenship status. So um, tell me how that will make a difference for us locally here at UC Davis and perhaps more broadly in the state uh, uh, for police forces. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to run that bill. As you know, to run a bill on behalf of the university and the office of the president, you need approval to be able to do that. And, and you were the first one to step out and believed in that and allowed me to run with that bill. But really what it'll do is allow any, any, any person in California, uh, regardless of status, to be able to become a police officer in California as long as they have work authorization from the federal government. And so what that means to us here that I learned when I first got here is we have several students that work for us as Aggie hosts. They work at the front counter. They do jobs for us, the police department. 
who are undocumented. And they found uh, the, really a desire to become police officers to serve their community after they graduate, but there was a roadblock. The, the, the law at the time said that you had to be a United States citizen. And I simply out loud asked the question and really wanted to have a debate at a statewide national level is why. Because in California, you can hold almost every position in California, regardless of citizenship. And, and I thought, why not policing? And, and so the debate, as it made its way through the legislature, we found uh, uh, across the aisle support for that bill where people all said the same thing. Why do we have that standard? It seems to be obsolete. And uh, that was removed. Governor Newsom signed that bill in the law in September. And now it allows us really any community member here in our campus who desires to be a police officer. We would like to you know, entertain that because really what we're trying to do at the end of the day is reflect our community. And undocumented students on our campus are part of our community, and what a better way to, to serve. Absolutely. I think both of us have been advocating for undocumented students um, th since we've been here and probably longer than that. Um, in a similar vein, you and I, both as men of color, have been vocal about um, standing up against hate speech. Um, why do you think that's important in your position, uh, and, and um, what do we do, how do we best denounce hate speech when we see it? Uh, exhibited by others. Yeah, you know, I tell you, if we, if we could, we could, if we could solve that here today, then you know we're doing really, really well. Yeah. And it's unfortunate that we live in a world that we don't always understand, we don't always appreciate it, and there is evil and there's hatred in this in this world. Uh, and I think our position and the roles that we have one is to be accountable, to stand up and denounce it when we see it, call it what it is. There isn't anything in between. Right, the water is either really hot or it's really cold, and it's not, you know, this is one of those issues you have to face it. And I wonder, I appreciate the fact that this university allows me sometimes to be outspoken. And normally in police departments, you remain a little bit more apolitical. You, you kind of roll the line and you don't step out. This university, they don't demand it, but you expect your leaders to stand up and be accountable. So one of the things that I enjoy most is I can do that. And when I see it, not as much as you do, but when I see it, I think that we have to call it out because it resonates with people. And you, sir, in the article I wrote recently in the contrast of two chancellors, I meant that. I meant it is the fact that I get to sit down every single day and watch our chancellor step out and, and hold the line on what he believes to be inappropriate behavior. People have crossed the line and you call it out. And, and you take hits for that sometimes. You know, people will, and I understand that, but, you know, you use your analogy. You got to be bold sometimes. So you have allowed your directors and others to do the same thing. And I'll equally try to do the same thing and call it out. And I think that's what we do from that. People see it. They hear it. We train. We educate. And little by little, I think we're making a huge difference. And I think people that come to UC Davis know we simply don't tolerate hate speech. We don't allow it. We don't appreciate it. And there's we have no use for that on our campus. I agree. And I, you know, I'm happy to be at a place that allows me to take those stances. And I want to make sure that I know that everyone who works with me and for me knows that they can also uh, be vocal in, 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 in those in aspects. Mm -hmm. um, another unique thing about you, um, you were elected president of the board of directors of the California branch, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. Um, so you're I, one of the first law enforcement officers, I think, to, to serve on that board. Correct. So um, I know it's an interest and a passion of yours. So tell me about your work with NAMI and the intersection between that work and law enforcement and mental health. Yeah, for, for those that don't know, NAMI is a national organization with a California chapter, uh, really for the purpose of advocating for those suffering from mental illness and their families, trying to remove the stigma and just make a better life for people suffering from mental illness. <clears throat> and as being a police officer, you know, I uh, was very, very interested in the response to critical incident response by policing. And I found my way onto the board, and from the board, I send it up to the, the presidency. So I am the first law enforcement officer ever to serve as the president. And I think that's really important because as we have the dialogue about how do we handle crisis intervention, either on a campus or anywhere in law enforcement, how do you do that? And there's certainly many examples illustrating that we don't always get it right currently. Sometimes the mere presence of a police officer can escalate rather than de-escalate situations. And so NAMI works very closely with law enforcement and, and groups to figure out a better way. Right here on our campus, we're imagining a better way by using our fire department, using our paramedics, using my counseling services, replacing the officer in the critical incident 
with health practitioners who specialize in this, where the officers would stand ready just in case things go really, really bad and you need them. Uh, you certainly don't want people to go into a violent situation, but we are paving the way to something better. And NAMI, uh, NAMI advocates that. They provide training for that. They provide policies for that. And it also allows me from this platform uh, not just to be restrict our efforts here at UC Davis, but system-wide throughout the entire system, through the CSUs, and through all the municipalities that are learning how we're kind of changing the narrative. Yeah, we, we've really been on a journey here at UC Davis to, to reimagine uh, mm-hmm. policing and campus safety. As you mentioned, we had a whole year-long task force uh, devoted to those activities. And tell me what you think about the outcome of that process and where you see the future of, of policing, both on campuses but even more broadly. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, all of us in our careers, we end up on task forces and we go to town hall meetings and, and people start talking about how we're going to make substantial change and sometimes the programs go off and sometimes they don't. This one, I think, though, has been well thought out. It was participated well with a lot of interaction, a lot of involvement, a lot of collaboration. And not just the one we did here at Davis, but also the one we did almost simultaneously with the Office of the President. We came up with dozens of recommendations to try to transform a good police department in something better, more contemporary, and somebody that really could earn the title of being role model. And I think we set our sights for that, and I think there's been challenges. One, as you change culture of policing, which you don't do by a policy or procedure or training, you change culture in many different ways, but also at the same time, educate our own institution and our communities on how we are changing and how we're different. Certainly the, the narrative of policing across America is not always good. It's just not. And we can, we can, you and I can sit here and, and fill this table with a list of things we've seen that we don't understand and we don't appreciate. And, and so can our community members. And I think that what we have tried to do is, is change the narrative here and have people look at what we do and how we're different and how we approach law enforcement more from the mindset of, I hate to use the cliche of guardian, but that's exactly what it is. We're not here, nobody wants to be policed. We don't police people on campus. And sometimes I wonder if the the police is the right word that we use, because that's not really what we do. We here provide safety, security, a peace of mind, and also physical to make sure that everyone that comes here can take in the full range of opportunities fairly equally across the board and really stay out of people's way until they need us. And so that's the cultural change. And I think that that's happening very quickly on campus. Still work to be done. Um, but I think we're a lot further down the road than we were a couple of years ago. And and I think within the next two years, you're going to see, I think we're going to be the state of the art. I, I certainly believe we're going to be able to set some pretty high marks. That's really well stated, Joe. And, mm-hmm. and I know that because of your experience with CHP and, and um, your leadership, uh, you're viewed, uh, uh, you're so well respected in the, in the community of police uh, within the system and beyond. So you're, you're really called upon for your points of view and, and, and um, uh, you're uh, a leader among the, the chiefs in the system. How, how do you feel about that responsibility? Does that, does that weigh heavily on you, or do you enjoy it, or how does that? Uh, it is a lot of work, you know, and, and I always hold true to my alma mater, which is going to be, although I didn't graduate from, I say alma mater, this is my home. I'm a, I'm a UC Davis Aggie, and, uh, and everything I do is all in here at UC Davis. But it's also at the same time an opportunity to lead. It's an opportunity to change the narrative with some of the other campuses. And we, we, it's not that I teach, it's that we work collaboratively, we try to learn from one another, we try to learn best practices, we try to develop policies that are very contemporary. Uh, we are, though, leading the, the charge of trying to see, achieve accreditation for all the campuses. Uh, as you well know, it was us in San Francisco that came out first, the other eight are following. But it's also an opportunity to introduce to them the, the state of the art, the only one in California, the Police Accountability Board. That is foreign, that is not, it's not done in California. And now here we are, through your leadership and President Drake, we're introducing Police Accountability board, Boards across the system. And that is gonna, certainly gonna be a, a role model and you're gonna certainly see other departments take that on in the very, very near future. So I, I think that, you know, while time consuming for some of these jobs, and you know the requests that come in, they always call you first and they ask. But I think that's what that's what these universities are about, is teaching. It, 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 it's what we're all about. And so I go about teaching a different way. 
Um, but at the same time, the, the premise is the same is to make it better. And so I'm honored to be able to do that. We certainly have made it better for the university system uh, in, in, in this area of campus safety. Um, and we'll do something a little more fun here. Yeah. Um, I want to change gears and uh, play a game we call Hot Seat. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've been on Hot Seats before. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. this one's a little different. Okay. I'm going to just ask you some rapid fire questions, and we're looking for a one word or one sentence okay. short answer. So here we go. Ready? Okay. Okay. Uh, time for a vacation mountains or beach? Beach. Best spot to grab lunch on campus? On campus, one of the dining commons. They're all they're all good. They are yeah. good. Uh, dog or cat person? Dog. <laughs> uh, who is your biggest inspiration? My biggest inspiration, Muhammad Ali. Interesting. One of my heroes as well. Yeah. Uh, favorite hobby? Golf. Golf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, great. You you actually followed directions. Most people don't give me the one word answer. <laughs> <laughs> they have to think about yeah. it. They, oh, yeah. oh. Anyway, uh, so thanks for letting me put you on the spot. Now it's your turn to ask me a question. You can ask me anything. Yeah, you know, uh, I would like to ask you a question. I, I, I see you every day. I see you work. Uh, every Monday morning, I have the privilege of listening to your weekly schedule. And I always sit there going, okay, I walked into this room thinking I have a busy week. Then I hear yours. I feel much better. I feel much better every single morning because I don't have your schedule. And it, it starts, for those that don't know, it starts very early in the morning. And many times, many times, you're concluding events at 10 o'clock at night. And it's not Monday through Friday. And a lot of times it's at least Monday through Saturday. And about twice a month you get Sunday off. So what does Gary May do when he gets away from the university? When you're away from the university and you have a chance to relax, uh, what's life for Gary May and Lachelle and the family? Well, you hit it right there. The most uh, cherished time I have is with my family. So whenever I can, I want to spend time with my wife, Lachelle, and with my girls. Um, they don't live here, so it's harder to make that time. But um, And then for hobbies, you know, I like to read, and, and I try to stay fit, so I go to the ARC, and I run, and I try to work yeah. out. So those are also therapeutic for me, clear my mind uh, from all the stress, from all those <laughs> meetings that, uh, that you just alluded to. Uh, so those are the kind of things that I like to do, but family is most important. It's yeah. paramount. So um, anyway um, – Thank you for being here. Uh, this has been a really stimulating, thought-provoking conversation. Um, and thanks to everyone for watching. Uh, we will see you next time on Face to Face. Go Ags. Go Ags.